advocating for the cause. Get proud of it. Whether it's national health care, women's issues, promoting a living wage, or protecting workers across the globe, the IAM and the labor movement has always taken up the causes that touch the lives of workers and their families, union or not. That's the tradition of the American labor movement. Uh, the American labor movement supports raising the minimum wage, and yet any unionized member, any IAM member, already makes far more than the minimum, minimum wage. So everything that we do does have the ripple effect through all of society. That's, that's why we're a movement, and we're very proud of that. It's really important that the Machinist Union is taking on that fight, because as we publish these, there's also a second audience and a third audience that we're looking at beyond our members. We're looking at the journalists who are actually writing stories about labor and about working families. We're looking at members of Congress and members of the state legislatures who are saying, I need an issue to grab onto, or I need an issue that I, I need to be aware of. The IAM and the labor movement built the middle class. But with gas at more than $4 a gallon, home foreclosures running rampant, health care costs rising and wages declining, the middle class can't do it alone. And the IAM is ready and willing to take on the cause. We have to convince uh, bargaining units across the country that we do fight for health care and their pensions and, and their wages here in Washington, D.C. Just because they don't see it in their backyards, it doesn't mean it isn't happening. And they do have a voice here that leaves their workplace every day and comes to Washington and talks on their behalf. But whether it's happening at your bargaining table or an ocean away, the Machinist Union understands the implications of working for the middle class. The ripple effects of a bad piece of legislation or improved working conditions will eventually touch all workers, regardless of their mailing address. The coordination that's going on is something that the company was doing amongst themselves for a long time uh, to the detriment of the workers. And with our department doing that now from location to location, sharing the best of the best, and I think it's key that the, those companies see the same negotiators from table to table. As I said, they can't, uh, they can't fool the union, they can't fool our members, and uh, at the end of the day, it's a good thing. These tools in the machinist toolbox are being used by unions around the world who are also taking up the same causes. A lot of what we do can be used in any industry, whether it's a three-person auto shop, an airline, someone making airplanes, heavy industrial equipment, uh, it, whether or not you're in the U.S., whether or not you're in Canada, whether or not you're private sector, federal sector. Working for better trade agreements is a good example of the IM's work of taking on a cause to help the world. The machinists have always been at the forefront of trying to make sure these agreements are fair to workers here and abroad. As corporations rapidly become to a, a place where they really have no home, where there are no U.S. companies, where there are no Canadian companies, where they are all just global companies. We need to be able to operate as a global trade union. In fact, that's the only way to take on a global corporation in terms of organizing and in terms of collective bargaining. It's also the only way to form a true partnership with a multinational corporation is if we can represent that corporation in terms of global, global issues and in terms of uh, global trade unionism. Owen Hernstadt, the director of the IAM's Trade and Globalization Department, says that's why we formed partnerships with unions that span the globe. If necessary, we can get support from our brothers and sisters in Australia, the UK, Germany, France, Sweden, and many, many others. It's all to create international solidarity. So our issues are shared with those in other countries. Right now, he argues, trade agreements are written for corporations looking to make a fast buck. And that's not fair to workers in any part of the world. Because if they were, these trade agreements would have in them, in their core part, fundamental human rights, a respect for fundamental human rights. 
making certain that workers have the freedom and the ability to form their own trade unions and to engage in collective bargaining. They would also have basic agreements prohibiting employment discrimination and child labor and forced or prison labor in them. But they don't. And they don't and they failed miserably. So instead of, you know, reacting to, you know, the, the trade agreements that come at us, which we do, we, we have to react to them and we have to re react harshly to them, um, we're also trying to develop some new underpinnings of how a trade agreement should be negotiated, who's involved in the process, and really what the values are in terms of negotiating that trade agreement. The members of the Machinist Union are leading the way on this issue and others. This was evident during the 2008 legislative conference when the men and women of the IAM stormed Capitol Hill with the concerns of workers everywhere. We have the finest members of any union. Uh, you know, the Hill was not the same the next day because our members went up to that Hill. And you know, the thing is, it is so important that our members know they have a right to talk to a politician. They have a right to ask that politician for a response, for a commitment on an issue, and people did that. This type of grassroots effort has always been the machinist way. This is not about political parties. This is about whether or not people are, that are elected to office are going to step up for working people. And if they're not going to step up for working people, we need to find somebody else. And it was this type of forward thinking that created the Women's and Human Rights Department at the IAM. Now, under the direction of Cheryl Eastburn, no one's issues are left behind. It's been successful, and, and women uh, now know that they don't have to sit in the back seat any longer, that they can sit up front, and if they want, they can drive. With the support of their brothers and through education classes at the Whippensinger Center, the women of the IAM have been given a forum to speak freely and empower themselves on issues that matter most to them. They have a comfort zone within that classroom environment and they are free and, and feel comfortable to speak out of, about things that have happened personally to them or to those that are close to them uh, in the, on the shop floor or, or on, the, on our properties. And I think it's, it's given them the uh, strength to, to talk about it and get it out. And the women of the IAM are taking their stories to the streets. We have uh, breast cancer awareness uh, cards, uh, lots of information on cervical cancer, and it's raised a lot of awareness. It's opened up a discussion in women's conferences that we haven't had in the past. Uh, you know, each other, each sister sharing a story about uh, how they've been affected by uh, either breast cancer, cervical cancer, uh, sharing those stories and, and uh, getting the support of the sisters uh, as well. It's been very, it's been a wonderful experience to, to see sisters being able to speak out and, and share their stories. In the end, this too will prove to be another weapon in the machinist's arsenal. Just as when it was founded 120 years ago, the mission statement of the IAM has changed little. The machinists are here to protect the interest of workers everywhere and to be an advocate for those, both here and abroad, who need a voice.